Apostles' teachings, into fellowship with the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you. We thank you, Father, for this word. We thank you for this passage. We thank you for the, what the foundation that was laid not only through Jesus going to the cross, but God also through the, the work of the apostles. And God, I pray, Father, that as we read through this text, that, or as we talk about prayer today, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here, anoint my lips, anoint your ears, so we all hear. I pray, Father, that it would just be more than just a message that we hear, but I pray that it would be something that we apply even to this week in our activities this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And with really my assignment, I, I guess, to, to today is to get you excited about prayer. It's a huge, it's a huge assignment. Because, you know, when you know when, when a church normally has like a prayer meeting, you know, like 1%, 2% of the people that actually attend the church actually even show up. You know, I, I was, I was, uh, when, when I was, I was a lead pastor before I came in here at a, an extension site, which is like we had a, a mother church, and we had, you know, uh, us as like the satellite um, incident going on in the neighboring city. And I used to tell people, I'm frustrated by the amount of people that are coming to our prayer meetings. And, and the person was like, well, how many people were at your last one? Forty. And he was like, he looked at me and he said, well, do you realize that based upon that number, you have almost 60% of your people attending a prayer meeting? And I sat there and I looked at him and I was like, okay, all right. Well, I guess those numbers don't seem so bad. And, and then I began to go, okay, well, that's fine. Okay, cool. Well, we'll just relax about how many people are coming to prayer. And then uh, over time, you know, the next, the next one we had, there was 20-something people there. And then the time after that, I think there was 20-something people there again. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, like, what had happened was is that in my attitude of just accepting it, the numbers had fallen down. And I believe that what we need to do as Christians is not to just settle for the fact that, well, there's only a few people here, and that's just the way that the normal might be. But I believe that we should have 100% of our church showing up for prayer. 100% of our people actually wanting to seek the face of God. Because that's what prayer is. I mean, prayer is just the attitude of saying, hey, we're going to gather together, and as we gather together, we're just going to begin to talk with God. And as we step there, and as we talk with God, we're going to see not only what God has to say about our own individual lives, but also about our corporate lives. You know, or even to the place of maybe it's not just the corporate prayer element, but I believe that so many people don't want to show up for the corporate element of it. It's because they don't have the individual life of prayer. And if you talk about the individual life of prayer, you know, which I'm about to jump into one of my points, but I, you know, it, it can be, it'll be a little bit weird sometimes. Because, you know, I mean, how many of you guys, as kids, as you were sitting there talking to yourself, someone looked at you and they said, don't talk to yourself, that's just weird. And prayer, to an extent, a little bit, you, you know, you know, kind of mirrors that. Because you can sit there and be talking, it's almost like, you know, you're driving around, you see that person, and, and, they're, and they're like deep into a conversation, and you're looking at them, and you're like, what's going on with them? What's wrong with them? Until they turn their head, and you see that they have Bluetooth. <laughs> you know, prayer, as you look at it, as you people are perceiving you, it can look a little weird. It can look a little bit of an interesting, a little bit dynamic that people just don't understand. They're like, why is that person laying on the ground? Why is that person kneeling on their knees? Why is that person walking around? Why is that person's eyes closed? Why is this? Why is that? Why is, why is, why is their eyes open and they're walking around talking? There's nobody there. There at times can look a little bit deceiving. It can look a little bit what I just labeled as weird. But just to do these past two weeks in regards to what we've already talked about is that the first week we've been talking about Pastor Mike did a great sermon on focusing on what we have in common. You know, not to just split off of, well, I do this, I do that, well, you know, I do my hair this way, well, I dress this way, well, I talk this way. No, but focusing on the things that we have in common. And then the second week, you know, we, we, we got an even, I don't want to say even better, because I don't want to like labor, but we got a great sermon from Pastor Donna about, about the focusing on worship. 
You know, in, in the attitude and the perspective, and you know, talk about the, the woman with the issue. Was it the woman with the what was the woman with the the alabaster box? I said issue with blood. And I was like, that's not right. I was like, that's not what you're talking about. But the alabaster box and, and, and the position that she had to take as an individual to worship Jesus. And talk about in a sense of what position are you in as you worship Jesus. And but today I want to talk about prayer. And, you know, anytime you talk about prayer, you just got to somehow talk about food as well. At least in the sermon that I preach. <laughs> so I'm going to talk, start with an illustration from A. Blanche. A. Blanche is one of what well, well, she used to be. She, 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 has, she has gone now to be with the Lord, but her and, and, and her husband were kind of like, you know, Uncle Doc and, and Aunt Blanche, they were like the matriarchs of our family. You know, it doesn't matter if they really were your uncle or your aunt, you refer to them as uncle and aunt. But Aunt Blanche used to make this coconut cake. I don't know about y'all, but I only like two or three things that I really, really like. Coconut cake, banana pudding, and pecan pie. <laughs> We can throw away everything else, just as long as we have coconut cake, banana pudding, and pecan pie. But you never kind of want to eat them all together because the pecan pie is like really sugary, so you kind of leave that one to last. You kind of go over to the coconut cake and you just look at it, you kind of just think, yes, that's amazing. It's a beautiful dessert. All the coconut on the outside, it's just amazing. It's beautiful. You cut it, you actually begin to eat it. You're like, ooh, yes, this is some good coconut cake. Now, now, Aunt Blanche, because you know, we have family recipes inside of my family, like maybe some of you guys do. So A. Blanche started to train up some of the younger folks in the family about how to make this coconut cake pie, coconut cake, so that when she was gone, we could still enjoy it as a family. I want you to know that it took years for people to master that. It took years for people to, you know, all of a sudden, they, they make a coconut cake that you even wanted to eat after tasting A. Blanche's coconut cake. Now, right now, I can go to my email and I can give you a list of all the things that are inside of it. And I can probably go out to the store, buy every single one of them, make the coconut cake out of the recipes that I know from that thing. But guess what? It ain't going to taste like her coconut cake. And I'm not really sure because I think you kind of have to measure it. Because even in the sense of what she did was, is that when someone asked her originally, can you write down how the recipe goes? She wrote it down and it was just, it went just like this. It wasn't a cup of sugar, it was just like a handful of sugar. <laughs> it was a twinkle of whatever else we had in the eye. And so we're looking at her, we're kind of like, hey, Clay, my hand is bigger than your hand. <laughs> my pitch is a little bit more of a, a twist, I don't know, but it, it just doesn't seem the same type of way. And sometimes inside of our Christian lives, we can get all the stuff right. We can go to the right school. We can do the meet the right type of people, learn to network, get the right type of job, live in the right type of community, send our kids to the right type of schools, but yet we're still lacking something. And the thing that I really feel that we're lacking, we're lacking the power and the authority to pray. Because prayer inside of our lives is like that special thing that Aunt Blanche did to make that coconut cake a coconut cake. You know, and so you might be like thinking, well, you know, I, 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 I'm just not sure about this. I'm just not sure about taking the time, you, you know, calling 7 a.m. or coming to the church on Tuesday at 5 p.m. I'm just not sure about it. I'm just a little scared. I just think that's a little bit weird. But I'm telling you, if you want to have the coconut cake type of life that ain't Blanche made, that you've got to put in the secret ingredient. The special sauce, the, the thing that makes it not just a cake. Because guess what? We can go down the Safeway and buy just a cake. We can go down to wherever else and, and just buy a cake. But I believe that God is not asking us to live lives that are just cakes. But he wants us to live that ain't ain't type of cake. That cake that once you leave it out for like a couple days, it tastes better than what it did when it came out the other. As people look at your life, that they go, man, there is something different about her. There is something different about him. And the thing is, it's not your 
job. It's not your education. It's not anything else outside of the fact that you've been in the presence of God. There's things that are loosened. There's things that are shaken. There's things that are as to who you are. And you might be like, okay, whatever, Teddy. You don't know what you're talking about. Yes, I do know what I'm talking about. Let me show you how I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, you know, just this week, and I'm talking about prayer, you know, there's so much in how the topic keeps coming up. You know, my my sister-in-law, you know, um, who, who lives in Washington State, they, she is like the there's the boss of the daycare, and she's like the person who's running the daycare, so I guess the coordinator or whatever. And, and she sent out an email, and she goes, you guys, I've got to share with you guys a testimony that just happened today. And, and she, she said, you, you know, we were looking at the numbers, we were looking at our enrollment for the summer and what's going to end up happening for the going through the city. And she said, we were going to have to, we're going to, we, we were literally going to have to make the decision to lay off two people. She said she sat there inside their office of the owner and, and, and they looked at each other and, and she came up with the great idea. You know, my, my sister-in-law said, hey, how about we pray? So she prayed. She said by the end of that day, not even 24 hours without them doing any advertising, without them having to do anything else, in the moment they prayed, by the end of that day, three more students showed up and enrolled. It was just the amount that was needed to keep those other two staff members. And I'm telling you, yo, we, we live in this very complex world, especially with us inside the Bay Area. We live in a very complex world. You know, I talk to people who are in New York, I talk to people that are in LA, I talk to people that are in other parts of the country, and this is what they tell me. Oh yeah, it was great. Yeah, oh yeah, this we was able to happen. No, that was able to happen. And I'm just looking at them and I'm hearing them and I'm like, yeah, that's awesome and that's amazing. But what did you have to do? And they give me all these complex, you know, ideas, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and I believe that some of those things have been added to places here in the Bay Area and they just have failed. And why? You know, I can talk about, you know, you know, there's a spiritual demonic, you know, the devil sits on the throne here and all that sort of stuff. And I'm not going to focus on that. I'm just going to focus on the idea of what we can do as believers and understanding that the power of prayer has the potential to do all the great bondages. You know, even this morning as, as, as I was thinking about, you know, you're kind of... Or you're going to like a meeting or something, it's like until you have that meeting, all the thoughts are kind of like inside your mind. You're kind of walking them through in your mind, you're talking to them. And, 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 and one of the thoughts that kind of came to my mind was the <coughs> idea that we can focus on what is not happening instead of focusing on the potential of what can happen. Come on. Because I believe that the, the complexities that we're dealing with, they're, they're not new. They're not new. If you open up your Bible and you read about some of the historical context of Corinth or um, the, 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 the St. Galatians is the name of the, you know, of the different complexities that were taking place throughout the Roman Empire, you begin to see that they were dealing with the same type of issues that we were dealing with. But yet at the end of this verse, in chapter and verse 47, it says, Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Favor will follow you if you have the presence of God. Yes. People will say, how did you do that? How did you end up making that happen? Don't worry about it. You just go, hey, it's favor. Yes. It's favor. Or it says, even the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved, those who were accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Why? Because they have the presence of God with them at all times. So my first point is prayer is for everybody. Prayer is not just for me. Prayer is not just for a select few individuals who, oh my goodness, they pray so well. Oh my goodness, you know, they, they have the potential to, to, to do whatever and do this and do that. No, no, no. Prayer is for everybody. And one of the reasons why we get caught up in not wanting to pray is because of shame. Because of maybe some of the sins and some of the things that we're dealing with and some of the things that that, that on this journey that maybe it was even something that you did last night going somewhere you weren't supposed to go. And I'm here to tell you, you know what? Shut it down right now. There is grace for you at the cross. And as you understand that grace, the shame is lifted off your life. And as the shame is lifted off your life, you can open your mouth and talk to God. I mean, how cool is that? He already knows what you did. 
Hey, you think you, you have a secret magic cloak that hides you from God? I'm gonna go, woo! I'm gonna go do my own thing. You know what I mean? No, 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 he already knows. He's just waiting for you to open up your mouth and begin to say, God, you know what? I'm so sorry in that situation that I did that. You know what, Lord? Forgive me. And it says inside the word that his grace is sufficient for you and for me. Amen. Amen. What does that mean? That means the fact that no, despite whatever you're doing, you might think, oh, it's so big, it's so huge, and God can't handle it. The creator of the universe cannot handle my mess. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm trying to let, let you know this right, right now. If he can create something out of nothing, and we all are here right now, that mountain and, and, and the way that the bay looks on a beautiful day and the clouds rolling through, picture perfect. If they can create as you go up there, maybe you guys been out to Yosemite and you see half moon, you know, or whatever it is, what's a huge mountain? Half dome. Yeah, half dome. I said half moon. We create half moon. <laughs> with the issues that you are dealing with right now. <laughs> you know, you might be saying, who am I to talk with God? Who are you not to talk with God? There you go. He's the one that has created you. You know, one of the things that I put next to this weird can, can seem to be just a, a one-way conversation as a child. You might have been told, don't talk to yourself. But I'm going to tell you this morning, keep asking, keep seeking, keep talking. Keep communicating with God. We talked a little bit about already about corporate prayer, individual prayer, but here was a prayer in, in which the disciples prayed. Disciples prayed for boldness in Acts chapter 4, verse 29 and 30. Now, Lord, consider the threats and enable your servants to speak your words with great boldness. Stretch out your hands to heal and perform miracle signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. As the disciples are praying this prayer, they were about to go through, they were actually experiencing great persecution. And instead of them saying, oh, it's just going to be us four and no more, we're done, we're checking out, they were waiting until Jesus comes back. No, what they said was, God, give us boldness. Yes. Yes. God, give us boldness. Yes. That in the midst of people <coughs> throwing rocks at us, that we can proclaim who you are. That in the middle of people talking a little bit funny and a little bit bad about us, that we can move past, move past our own insecurities, move past our own doubts, move past our own things that we're dealing with, and we can say, Jesus, we proclaim who you are. Yes. And then not only do they pray for that, but then they pray, God, stretch out your hand and handle this. How many of us are trying to handle things that we don't need to be handling because we sit up here think that we are the solution? And what Jesus is facing, the disciples are basically saying inside this moment is that we can do this, but we can't do it by ourselves. There's things that need to be politically shifted. There's things that need to happen that we know nothing about. There, there, there's, there's circumstances and things that people need to say and speak over what we're doing that we have no control over. You know, I was a little, I used to play Little League baseball. <laughs> Actually, it was T-ball. <laughs> you know, I thought it was really cool. You know, I was wearing like the little socks. I mean, baseball is like amazing for like that, man. You got you to be, you, you, you look stylish. Like it's like a uniform. And you get to like, you know, I, I, I used to have, you know, you know, a big belt. And I would tuck it in, but I would like sag. Because that was like our thing, you know. And I would be like, yeah, I'm cool. You better believe it. And, and so we had gone to the I, I, I think we were at Hunter's Point, and, um, and, and so we were playing a, like, like a rec league thing, and we were playing the folks at Hunter's Point, and we had stomped them. I'm talking about stomped on them. I am know we beat them by at least 10 points T-ball, okay? If you beat someone by 10 points T-ball, you know, you really stomped on them, okay? So we walking off, off the field, we all walking to our cars, and we're like, yeah, and, and y'all walking with friends, and so two of them, you know, there's like, there's like the opening, and then there's like the fence, okay? So, you know, everyone's talking to me, but my friends, they jump the fence, you know, because that's what boys do. We jump the fence, we even though there's a perfectly clear walkway right, right? right here. <laughs> Some people are like, do you want boys? And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not really sure if I'm, you know, they, they just think differently. Like, my daughters would never jump a fence. 
thing. Even if it was like that big, they, they would probably skip over it or something. But, 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 but they would make sure that they're safe, okay? So there's an opening and then there's like the fence and we decide we're gonna jump the fence. Well, you know, I'm trying to be cool, but I had never jumped a fence before. <laughs> so I'm like halfway over, you know, like I'm about to get over, like I'm proud of myself. I'm high, I'm about to get over it. All of a sudden I feel this hand grab me and pull me down. And I turn around and it's my dad. <laughs> He's like, come on, boy. You know, and so he walks on right, well, he tells him to me. I'm like, hey, buddy, you embarrassed me in front of my friend. I was almost to the top. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and so he, so, so as we're walking, you know, so we get to the car, he's like, okay, this is why I pulled you off the fence. He goes, I pulled you off the fence because there was a young man from the other team that y'all had just slaughtered. Who, was a, who had a bat in his hand and was about to hit you over the head. And what happened was I grabbed the bat, threw it down, grabbed you, and walked you through the fence. See, sometimes you're trying to do things. You're trying to grab the bat. You're trying to climb the fence. You're trying to go through something that God is saying, I don't need you to go through that. Let me handle that. So let me handle that child. Let me handle that job. Let me handle that boss. Let me handle that living situation. Stop trying to figure it all out and understand that you have a father in heaven who is watching over you like my dad was watching over me that day. But he's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's not going to leave you on that fence for someone to knock you down with their head and you fall down, you're bleeding, you're doing all this. He's not going to do that. Or maybe you find yourself in a situation right now and, and, and you are laying on the ground, kind of like someone hit me on the head, I was trying to do something amazing, and they go, you know what, maybe you just need to ask the question, what did I not trust God in? Did I even lift this up to God in prayer? Did I even, you see, prayer is not the last minute result of it. relationship with someone, you don't just pray then, you pray when they're small. I remember as a little kid, my grandmother would lay over my bed, and I'd be like, go away, I don't want you right here. But she would lay her hands on me, and she would pray. I pray for his future spouse. Yes. I pray that he knows, she knows Jesus. I pray that, that even if she does it right now, that, that she will come to the knowledge of who Jesus is. Yes. She prayed for my wife before I even knew my wife. You know, it, 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 it's the second like thing, you know, prayer is an offensive tool, not a defensive tool. The second thing you need to know about prayer is prayer is effective. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, It says, Therefore, the message to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. It's powerful and it's effective. Jesus said to his disciples, Pray. That you will not fall. I pray that you will not fall into temptation. Luke 22, verse 51. Maybe you're some, someone who's struggling with, with just the issues of life. You're struggling with the fact of, you know, that you are dealing with some stuff. And you're being tempted to do some stuff. You know what? I just encourage you to pray. When you start feeling those feelings rise up, just go to God and pray. You know, it's, it says, pray that they will not fall into temptation. Prayer has the ability to keep us from slipping up, doing something that will lead to shame. Which, remember, I told you about before, shame is the thing that keeps us from even opening our mouths. Prayer. Prayer is for everyone. Prayer is effective. Jesus prayed for all these believers then, now, and for all times. And you might be like, I'm having a rough deal with this. Where is Jesus? Remember that Jesus prayed for you. Before you even confess to he was. So watch this in John chapter 17, verse 20. My prayer is not all is, is not for them alone. It's about for his disciples who were there right in front of him. He says, I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. We are those. So that means generationally, we need to understand that prayer has a potential to reach into future generations. You know, sometimes I look at my wife and I's life, and, 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 and by some people's standards, they're like, hey, you guys have it rough. By my standard, I'm like, no, we are blessed. Yes. 
We are thriving. We are moving forward. We are accomplishing great things for, for, for God. But as I look at my life and some of the things that God has brought me through, you know what? It wasn't my prayers that got me through that. It was prayers of people like Amy Blanche. It was prayers by, by Uncle John. It was prayers that were prayed three or four generations ago that lift, are lifting me and that I'm still experiencing the blessing of I'm telling you right now, you can pray prayers right now for your great, 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 yes. even extended great grandkids that they will walk into. Yes. Because we live in a way, we, 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 we praise a God that is generational. You know, prayers, Jesus' prayers transcend the time. But this is the last thing, and I'm going to close with this. Is prayer is a sign of trust hmm. and love. <clears throat> we have limits, but God has it. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39 says, My Father, if, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. God, can you remove this? God, Father, can, can you somehow intervene and change all this situation? Send someone else to the cross, is basically what he's saying. But then it says a period. So that means it stops. And then it starts again, and it starts again with this. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Yes. See, the thing about prayer is that when you understand what the potential that prayer has been able to do, you begin to trust in God. And so sometimes you might not get the answer that you want. Mm. You don't just say, oh, I'm not hearing for God. I'm moving forward. No, what you say is, you know what? Let me back away from this in this moment. What you say is, you know what? It's not clear right now. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to wait on the Lord. Yeah. You know what? I don't have all the, you know, because of God who, who is all in heaven, who knows everything that, 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 that's going on. And if he hasn't, you know, given me the clarity in which I need, you know, and sometimes, you know, and, and I'm telling you, as, as, as folks who are a little bit Pentecostal in the sense of what we do, because we like to name it and claim it. We like to, I'm moving. I, I'm knocking it down. You know, sometimes in the sense of that way that God has made us, we want to be under type of spirit, you know, in a sense that we want to create it, it's in those moments where we've got to step outside of who we are Amen. and literally say, you know what, I'm going to stop being that professional. In this moment, I'm just going to be who Jesus wants me to be. I'm going to wait upon him. I'm going to understand that he is the king of my life. He is the Lord of my life. And I know it's hard because sometimes I've got to do it and I'm like, no, I want to go. No, I want to make it happen. Psalms chapter 19 verse 47 David says I rise before dawn and I cry for help I put my hope in your word and this isn't David I, I mean I, I don't think this is David you don't want to be a logical you probably come and tell me later so Don will tap me on the shoulder later on and tell me I was wrong no I don't know but, uh, but, 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 but I don't see this as just something David did when he was hanging out with the sheep I see this as King David who was saying this a man of power, a man of influence, a man who had the people at the disposal. We can tap, the, you know, you know, tap, you know, what do you call that? Snap his fingers, and they can do it. And he says, "No, no, no. What I will do is I will rise early, and I'm not just rising early. And I'm not one of those people that's like I pray early in the morning. That is not me. You will not find me at no five o'clock, six o'clock prayer meeting." Unless God tells me that. Please don't, Lord. Please don't tell me that. I'll say <laughs> But I'm the type of guy who's late at night, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock. You know, I'm the guy who likes to pray at those times because I just like for it to be dark. You know, I like it, you know, I just like to be dark. And I like to see stars. I like to walk in and kind of walk around the house. And plus, honestly, if you're in my house, you know, the activity really starts like at 6.30 in the morning. And really, if I were early, I've had the red blaze like at 4 o'clock in the morning. When we want to bed at 12, so I'm only four hours of sleep, and I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh. So for me, it just doesn't work right right now. But the whole idea is not necessarily the time, but it's the idea. He says, I cry for help. Yes. I pray. I give it to Jesus. And then David and I the need to get up in the AM. And so... A, a, so a dependence in God by crying out for help. And so here goes some, you know, as, as we end, here goes some prayer tips for you guys. 
I think there's like six or seven, I don't know how many there are, but those are kind of like a few. Here they are right, right here. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to, to do this. You see how I haven't talked anything about the posture of prayer. I don't even know if we're going to cover that exact like series, but, but it, it's very similar to worship. But here goes some prayer tips. I know some of you guys have been raised in churches, or maybe you've seen a church on TV, and so you think that there's a certain type and a certain form of praying. And I'm here to tell you, you know what? Use your words. You know, I remember we were sitting in a, in a prayer meeting one time, and we had this, this guy who was an ex-drug dealer. He was actually one of the leading drug dealers at the area of the church that I came from at one period. Gave his life to the, the Lord, radically transformed. But we used to be in prayer meetings, and he would cuss sometimes. And I was, you know, and I was raised in church, so I'm like, you know, those women just want to slap them. You know, some of you guys right now, your eyes got really big. <laughs> but you really think God is really hurt by the fact that he said a cuss word? Right. No. <laughs> and, you know, I think God is like, come on, I need more folks like him who just show up to prayer meetings. Who just show up in a sense of really be used by God. Choose your own words. The, best, the second thing is, time, time is a time to be honest. It's a time for you literally to stop playing the game of church because when you're in prayer meeting and it's you and someone else who are interceding for people's lives, sometimes what you've got to do is sometimes you've got to get to a place and be like, you know what, honestly, I'm not right and we can't pray until I get right. The third thing is there is no ideal posture. It is not laying down on like, like, like a cross like the Catholics do. You don't necessarily have to do that. You can do that. It might, you know, getting on one knee, getting on, you know, saying it on your head. No, no, it's a that, that Now, you, whatever you decide to do, that's what you do, okay? It's, there's not an ideal posture. There is no ideal time. You know, the, the Bible says pray without ceasing. There you go. You know, from, 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 from me, I really got this. When, 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 when this guy from Africa came to our church when I was like in high school, and, and, and he was over at the pastor's house, and I'm sitting there at the pastor's house grabbing lunch, and he's going around mumbling. And I'm like, what is he going around there mumbling for? But what he was doing was he was meditating and praying scriptures as he was walking around all day. Prayer isn't this thing where you go, okay, I got 15 minutes, Lord, you got 15 minutes to talk to me. <laughs> Lord, you got an hour. You know, you know, I mean, whatever it's something that you just do continuously. You know, the, the other thing is, is to start off with short prayers. Maybe you're someone that you don't even have the discipline of prayer in your life. Start off with short <coughs> prayers. Start by praying for your food. Lean over next to maybe praying for your kid. Do these short, dynamic prayers and just using their own words. The next thing is just talk, but remember to leave room to listen. Talk to God. But leave room to listen. But first year of marriage, I did a lot of talking. Second year, I did a lot of listening. Because I had done so much talking. The next thing is don't be afraid to pray for things you think are impossible. Because of the complexity and the sense of the place in which we live, guess what? Prayer is not something that we just like, oh, okay, cool, I might get to know. This is something that is a necessity for where we're at for what we're doing, how we're doing it, and all that type of stuff. One of the things in, in which, you know, as, as I close, you know, the musicians are going to come, going to come back because they help me close a little bit faster. <laughs> but, but even with that, you know, it's, it's, you know, one of the things, you know, in, a, in the sense that, you know, I really feel, feel like God wants us to know is that as we pray for the impossible, we need to really believe that it can happen. You know, every single, well, uh, the, the, the last few weeks on Sunday afternoon, my wife and I were playing the church in San Francisco, not even living in San Francisco right now, and so it's like, it seems like it's like this impossible thing, but we go to open houses, and, and we drive around, we're going over the house, I'm praying, Lord, somebody write me, though, my wife is praying, Lord, someone write a check for $1 million, right, and I'm like, no, Lord, don't pray for $1 million, Lord, we pray for $1.5, because I got to cover the insurance and all the other stuff that for you, too. selfish with your prayers. Your prayers are just for you. Your prayers are for people out there that are hurting. You know, I read this book when I was at seminary called The Evangelism of Prayer. Prayer as a method of evangelism. As you walk and you see someone limping, you can walk up to them and be like, you know what, can I pray for you? And maybe God will touch and heal in that situation. Maybe he won't. But guess what? You'll never see miracles. 
miracles if you never pray for them. Amen. The next thing is, is that it can have a generational effect, which is already what I talked about. You know, I know this isn't like the you know, type of message, but, but, but it's really important for us to know how to pray. You know, or to, to not even really know how, but just to do it. And so even this Sunday, Thank you.